Welcome to uh, Englewood Hospital Medical Center. Um, what we'll present to you today is called patient blood management. This is a concept which is uh, taking hold not only in the state of New Jersey, uh, but nationally as well as now internationally. We're fortunate uh, to have this concept uh, grow at this institution and have been considered leaders uh, in this area of medicine. The uh, intent here is to uh, give you an overview of what patient blood management is, what some of the issues and problems which uh, not only relate to transfusion, but also give you an inkling of the amount of data and information that we've been able to gather over the last uh, close to 15 years treating patients for whom blood is not an option, something that we, uh, we do here and have uh, developed expertise. My name is Arya Shander, and you could see my credentials on the slide, but in fact, uh, I'm also the executive medical director of the uh, Department of uh, Patient Blood Management and Bloodless Medicine and Surgery here at Englewood Hospital Medical Center. So for those of you who are new, uh, these concepts may uh, create some challenges but keep in mind that there's plenty of us all over the hospital and we're available on a 24-7 um, uh, hour uh, and days of the week uh, for uh, backup or for resources or any issues that you have when it comes to uh, issues associated with patient blood management. For those of you who uh, are already uh, members of the medical staff, keep in mind that the same message in terms of resources for you, and some of this may be review, but some of this may also be an update. So without uh, further discussion, let me now address the issue of patient blood management with you. The issue of blood uh, and transfusions have always been an emotional topic. This is a publication that was written by Douglas Starr, published in 2000. It's a book. It's not easy reading, but it actually uh, employs some of the, um, the knowledge that we have of blood and the commerce of blood. And you could see how emotionally this, uh, uh, this topic is, or how emotionally charged this topic is. Uh, from the uh, publisher's description of the book, you could see that this book talks about the sweeping story of a substance, meaning blood, that has been uh, feared, revered, mythologized, and used in magic and medicine from the earliest times, a substance that has become, again, uh, the center of a huge secretive and often dangerous worldwide commerce. So it, this just gives you the other dimension, if you will, of blood and transfusion, what we'll talk about today is what we encounter not only in the bedside, but something in terms of resources for hospital. Now, blood management is a term you may have heard of in the past, and blood management is centered, again, around the product. It talks to you about the issue of inventory, if you will, in terms of donor blood, meaning the acquisition or the procurement of blood from donors. Uh, and then, of course, there's the process of, of the acquisition of blood by hospitals, leading to transfusion or the users, which are generally healthcare providers, who again relate this commodity through the act of transfusion. So everything revolves, if you will, around the product in terms of the safety and the availability of this product. And this is how we've been viewing this for uh, years and, uh, and generations, if you will, in healthcare. On the other side, if you will, of patient blood, uh, pa uh, blood management is that concept of patient blood management, which we'll address with you today, where the center, the focus, of course, is the recipient or the patient, and how patients can actually manage without getting any of this so-called product-centered blood management, and yet do well with improved outcome. As we discuss the topics today, one of the things that we have to address with you is of course the tension between anemia and transfusion for the clinician. We'll talk a little bit about anemia, some of the definition, the clinical impact of anemia, and the outcome, if you will, of patients with anemia. Then transfusion, which has become a, a default, if you will, for clinicians for the treatment of anemia, and then move on to patient blood management with the definition and the five drivers we know for, again, a paradigm shift from the product 
to the patient and how these paradigm how this paradigm shift relates to these drivers and of course we'll give you some outcome data both from this institution and possibly from others so the WHO and this is going back now uh, 50 or 60 years ago now the the the, uh, the WHO which is uh, a the health uh, the World Health Organization defined anemia based on an arbitrary number and as you could see there's a wide distribution of normal hemoglobin for males and females females being on the left side of the slide males being on the right side of the slide the arbitrary number for females that are 12 grams or less of hemoglobin per deciliter was considered to be anemic and for male, it's 13 grams per deciliter is a consideration for the diagnosis of anemia. In fact, you see that the line crosses the normal. So there's uh, lots of controversy when it comes to this issue. In the United States, we've defined anemia with a half a gram higher than that. But for ease, if you'd like to choose one number, I recommend the use of 13 grams per deciliter for both genders rather than remembering so many numbers in terms of the definition of anemia. Now, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of controversy around the definition of anemia in the hematological literature, but uh, in fact, using a single number or the WHO uh, will keep you on track if you need to treat patients, identify or diagnose, uh, uh, diagnose them. The incidence of perioperative anemia uh, this is now patients are admitted to the hospital, so this is not just the surgical population, but it's also the medical population, rises with age and is almost the same for male and female. Other data suggest that there's actually a crossover at somewhere around the 60 age where males have more of a preponderance in terms of anemia than female. But you could see that uh, the message from this slide is that anemia clearly is age dependent, if you will, so the older the population gets, the likelihood that we're going to encounter anemic patients is higher. Now, uh, the data that we have, and some of this is very large data for Medicare, uh, you could see this is a 5% Medicare sample from 1996 through 1997, encompassing more than a million subjects. You could see that anemia is a multiplier, if you will, of a risk. Uh, of any of these diseases that are listed on this slide, including chronic kidney disease, congestive heart failure, and the two together, both or, or each one individually, when associated with anemia, have a high mortality. We also know that anemia is a multiplier of disease. This, again, uh, shows you the risk, the relative risk of a two-year mortality um, when you have no anemia or no disease, if you will, and when you have anemia alone, uh, it resembles almost the same uh, relative risk of chronic kidney disease. Heart failure has a higher one, if you will, but when you start adding anemia to any of these uh, individual disease states, you could see that it's a multiplier of risk of mortality. We also know that uh, from this publication uh, that uh, it came to life about uh, two years ago, that uh, for the patients undergoing elective sur non-cardiac surgery, that the presence of anemia, and you could see the splaying occurs early, is associated again with increased risk of mortality compared to those patients who are not anemic. So in summary, if you look at this for the non-surgical versus the surgical population, anemia again for both population actually represents a significant risk. So um, what's happened actually is that there's a default in the sense that clinicians feel comfortable with the fact that if they um, um, recognize a patient having anemia that the default, uh, um, the default, in, default in intervention uh, ends up being transfusion of red cells. And in fact, the data which I'll show you suggests that transfusions compound the problem actually and don't resolve it. So you may get rid of the quote anemia by raising the hemoglobin level higher, but you will not uh, improve patient outcome, which is an issue. And the perception, and for this, if you will, default condition, is that the safety of blood is high. And we hear that constantly from those who deliver blood to us, saying the blood is the safe it's ever been. But is it completely safe? And the answer is no. That the risk of blood is very low, especially if it's someone else who's getting it and not the person ordering it. 
And the risk of anemia is unknown until we've described this to you. So that uh, there's a concern in terms of anxiety of clinicians when they look at an acutely anemic patient, but the risk is really not well understood by many clinicians who take care of patients. For the surgeons, the risk of surgical bleeding has always been considered to be low, and of course transfusion is a rare activity for many surgeons, if you will, if you ask them, but if you actually look at the data, it is a considerable a number of patients who are undergo surgery would get transfused. So um, just to describe the assumptions, if you will, as well as the default situation, the classic premise is if a patient is found to be anemic, anemia means increase in risk of ischemia, specifically cardiac ischemia. Therefore, transfuse the patient, and by transfusing, will increase the hemoglobin right away, will improve the oxygen delivery, so to DO2, and this will lead to an increased VO2, which is oxygen utilization, and hence, again, reverse the ischemia and that's how we've gotten into this default position now this is not one size fits all because uh, again some patients will do very well with low hemoglobins with others don't but the default situation makes it one size fits all and in the absence of demonstrating any benefit of transfusion many patients get transfused because of this default position and all they're receiving is risk in the absence of benefit now, um, in addition to the fact that we have the default situation, we also have this irrational approach to transfusion. It's not just red cells, it's also plasma and platelets, but we are talking mostly about, plasma, uh, about red cells today. And uh, these, uh, again, three studies are as a um, tip of the iceberg, but just to show you that in, in, besides the fact of being a default position, besides the fact that this is an emotional topic, it is also not science by any means because there's a huge variability or cultural variability in transfusion, not only amongst institutions, but amongst the clinicians within the institution. And right now, with our concern in terms of healthcare costs and appropriateness of care, again, this is going to be looked at by both uh, government as well as other agency. Somatics, uh, you could see institutional dropout of transfusion rate and coronary artery bypass graft range from 0 to 86%. This is a very wide variation. Turgeon, again, uh, this is a Canadian publication. A different transfusion threshold between different physicians and different specialties. That is intra-institutional. And Lakoski, again, showed wide variability in current uh, perioperative transfusion practice. And we've known this for decades, but nothing really has been done to mitigate this variability. Now the concern lies in the fact that um, whether, whether you subscribe to this or not, uh, this is what the data that we have is that transfusion confer risk to the recipient, uh, both a host of infectious as well as non-infectious risks. The non-infectious risks clearly are the major ones today that we're trying to get our mind around them because they include immunomodulation and immunosuppression, if you will. And as a result of these risks, when we can't confer benefit for patients, there is an association in terms of patients' worst outcome related to transfusion. In addition to this, transfusions are known to be costly, and many institutions that have a large budget for transfusion are now looking at ways of making it more appropriate. If we can reduce variability as well as look at a risk-benefit ratio that's a positive one, uh, we may be able to save significant amount of resources for hospitals and those resources you know are getting tighter and tighter uh, because of not only the economy but also the rise in health care costs. And then there's always the blood supply issue and there's always the concern that we may not have enough blood to provide it for those who either accept blood or need the blood because of a significant uh, trauma or surgical bleeding that's not contained. Under the circumstances, the blood delivery services, if you will, have always looked to the donor population and trying to increase them, but no one's looked at the side of the user, which is what we're trying to, again, convey to you today, that this is where the margin lies is in the usage, not in a donor, since less than 5% of the eligible donor population in the United States donates blood and unless we have a national disaster, that number is actually going to go down rather than increase because the, uh, there is increase in use of blood in the United States, 
by the elderly population. As I showed you, anemia goes up with age, as does complex surgical procedure, but the uh, donor population is pretty stable. In addition, there's always concern that a new pathogen will enter into the blood system in the United States and by doing so will infect the system and blood availability will decrease dramatically very quickly. Now who is the patient that we're talking about? On this diagram, which again is a schematic diagram, there are no numbers associated with it, but we know that on the tip, the left side of this distribution of those patients who get transfused, that blood uh, can save lives in a trauma patient, so say in a hemorrhaging obstetrical patients. However, that coined term of blood saves lives is in fact only part of the armamentarium of what we do for these patients. Patients will not survive no matter how much blood you give them if you don't stop the bleeding. So part of the resuscitation effort uh, relies on blood components and those really are reserved for a small population of patients in the United States, those who bleed profusely from trauma or from a coagulopathy. In fact, on the other side, we know that transfusions are associated with mortality secondary to complications, whether it be ABO incompatibility or transfusion-related acute lung injury. We can predict, if you will, because we know that there is a certain frequency of these, so death is associated with transfusion on the right side of the slide. In the middle is that variable population, the one who get one to three units of blood in hospitals, because many times people still order two units at a time. And that's where patient blood management and usage can reduce this and I'll show you down to zero because, again, there are other modalities that we can use to treat patients and get the result that we want, which is improved patient outcome. So blood management, rather than patient blood management, was defined early days as the appropriate transfusion practices. That's a major concern for the blood industry, and we have not been able to overcome that. That blood conservation be regarded and treated with the same importance as transfusion medicine. For some reason, it's, it's important to say that a unit of blood coming from the American Red Cross is a precious resource, but at the same time, liters of patients' own blood in an operating room may go down the drain, and that blood is much more precious. Number one, it is the patient's. Number two, it is fresh blood. Uh, it doesn't suffer from any of the storage lesions, and of course it's compatible and can be retained to, returned to the patient. But the, um, uh, let's put it this way, that the, the desire, if you will, and the effort uh, that needs to be put into returning the blood to the patient is very low in hospitals because they can rely on a product which is inferior to the patient's blood, which is the uh, blood uh, bank uh, components. And that if you put this all together, it has to improve patient outcome in, patient, in blood management. And of course, as I mentioned to you, it uh, needs to be patient-centered. So we've evolved, if you will, from blood management, which really talks about the product, although we tried in earlier days to define it in a VIN diagram you just saw, to where we are today. And patient blood management, and we ascribe this definition to the Society for the Advancement of Blood Management, it's sabm.org. And the definition goes that patient blood management is the timely application of evidence-based medical and surgical concepts designed to manage anemia, optimize hemostasis, and minimize blood loss and blood transfusion in order, again, to improve patient outcome. And we, again, describe, if you will, the three pillars of patient blood management. And the first pillar has to do with battling one of the biggest threats, if you will, for patients who are hospitalized or those undergoing surgery, and that's anemia. Anemia and hemostatic defects should be, again, those that are acquired should be addressed early and need to be addressed effectively before uh, intervention. But a lot of patients get into a hospital, remain anemic during their hospitalization, and I will tell you that anemia inv invariably results in transfusion, if not addressed properly. 
And there are different kinds of anemia. They need to be diagnosed appropriately and treated appropriately. We use the surgical example, if you will, for these patients who undergo surgery, of course, and show about minimizing blood loss or bleeding during surgery or collecting the blood or doing everything we can to use topical hemostatic agents, whatever it is in the armamentarium that we're going to be using, to minimize the blood loss. But this is not just the surgical patients. The largest drain of blood of patients doesn't occur necessarily in the operating room. It can occur on the medical, pediatric, and surgical floors by ordering multiple tests daily without looking at the results or without questioning the need for these tests. So if we can minimize and reduce or eliminate unnecessary blood tests, just to know is not enough. You need to know so that you can change the course of therapy or that the condition of the patient is changing and you need to know why. Under those circumstances, it may be appropriate. But daily bloods are ordered constantly on patients. We review them within seconds and most of the times don't address some of the abnormalities. But in fact, the patient who is admitted to a hospital may not be able to make the same amount of blood that's removed from them on a daily basis through phlebotomy. They may not be able to replace that volume of blood because they're ill. And lastly, is to accept the fact that if you treat anemia, whether it be postoperatively or after your diagnosis in the hospital, that a transfusion may not be needed at all. The fact of the matter is many patients don't get their anemia treated, come into the hospital, the anemia is aggravated, get discharged from the hospital without anything being done to treat their anemia. And if their hemoglobin goes low enough, this response we get is, well, they can be transfused. Well, that is not really good medicine, uh, if you will, knowing that the risk-benefit, as already mentioned to you, is in favor of non-transfusion. Now, the nice thing about this patient blood management is the fact that this is multidisciplinary and everyone around the patient is responsible, if you will, including the patient. So having everyone communicating and everyone working together with the goal of improving patient outcome clearly is formidable, and here's something uh, that will help you do that and get familiar with the team. And going back to the offer we made where resources are available makes this, um, um, drives the point. Now, uh, this is very difficult to read. There's no question because there's so much on the slide. But the reason I'm showing you the slide is so that you know that these are all the different modalities that are available that will compete with transfusion, not only with good results, but many times with better results because you are goal-directed your therapy towards the underlying condition of the patient. So no matter where you are, whether you're in the operating room or on the floor, this is what it, uh, what it looks like, and we will make all these available to you because in our institution there are. Here's one modality. Um, again, this doesn't preclude others, but just to give you an idea, this is called acute normovolemic hemodilution, and this is used in the surgical population. And what we do is we diagnose preoperatively anemia in our patients. Those patients who are anemic who are going for either urgent or elective surgery, we postpone them if the diagnosis of anemia is, um, is made, just like we would postpone a patient who has undiagnosed or unworked up a uh, cardiac condition, a pulmonary condition, or a hepatic condition. So we treat anemia in the same fashion because we have the data showing that patients going for cardiac and non-cardiac surgery who are anemic prior to the procedure have worse outcome. So we treat them, and here's a hemoglobin of 13, say, in a male patient. And what we do is after induction of anesthesia, we remove whole blood from the patient kept at the bedside at room temperature. Whole blood is the best transfusion you can get. And if it's your own, it is much, much better than any blood that you can get from any blood bank in the United States or abroad. So you can see here there's a, a suggestion of four units of whole blood. The hemoglobin of the patient drops, you could see, by the grams that are ascribed to each one of those units. Uh, each unit may actually have a little less hematocrit because we now replenish the patient with high viscosity fluid, which is hydroxyl starch in our institution, 
and now the blood is dilute in the veins of the patient. And if they lose blood during surgery, we also can collect it, but at the same time it's so dilute because most of the red cells, the plasma and platelets, are kept in these bags of blood by the patient's bedside. If they reach the need to be transfused or at the end of surgery, we return this safely to the patient and again, if these patients underwent coronary artery bypass grafting, we've gotten an aliquot of their blood which is not tainted by extracorporeal circulation and these platelets are much more functional and ready to move on any issue that the patients may have. And you could see the procedure can be done in patients who agree to it for whom blood is not an option or any patient who comes into our institution where blood loss is anticipated to be between a liter and a liter and a half or more. If there's a type and cross, they may be candidates for acute normovolemic hemodilution. Now interestingly, in the operating room in this hospital, we could take this whole blood and actually separate the blood into plasma, platelets, and red cells. The platelet bag is over here. You can see the green is the symbol. Here's your plasma. And here are the red cells that have been separated from that whole blood that we took from the patient. And we can repeat this process. And this process can be repeated for patients who agree to have acute normovolemic hemodilution, despite the fact that blood may not be an option for them, that is bank blood. Now, by doing so, we can now direct our therapy to coagulation abnormalities or platelet dysfunction or basically anemia intraoperatively. We essentially have made the patient their own blood bank. So now, uh, for those patients who agree to have that, meaning patients for whom blood is not an option or the general population, we have reduced the exposure to allogeneic blood not only significantly but down to zero. Now again, there are some data out there. This is a randomized controlled trial looking at un patients undergoing liver resection and you could see not only is prospective randomized but they had guidelines and criteria for transfusion and they had targets for ANH and also a target at transfusion. And as you look at this data and the references on top, I will tell you that the patients who undergone ANH in this study had less than a third of the number of units transfused postoperatively than those who did not undergo acute novolemic and dilution. In addition, infection rate in the transfused versus non-transfused population was almost twice. So the benefits with randomized con uh, controlled trials have been demonstrated. Now, we also use blood salvage intraoperatively as another modality because, as I mentioned earlier in the topic, we talked about this commodity of red cells versus the own patient's own blood. And there are contraindications, restricted indications by the FDA for cell salvage, which include malignancy or presence of malignancy, obstetrics, as well as contaminated blood, generally speaking, in trauma. But in this institution, and many others now have joined, both in Europe as well as in the United States, we use these, um, uh, this equipment or this modality in obstetrics and cancer surgery and also in patients who may have contaminated uh, shed blood. And we use what's called a high quality wash. In addition to that, we use something called leukocyte depleting filter. And all those, by the way, will reduce the risk almost down to zero, if you will, or to less than a, a hundredth of a percent. Um, again, the data is accumulating, uh, but uh, we, we based our intervention on good data at the time, um, suggesting that using uh, the use of cell salvage in obstetrics as well as with malignancy um, uh, is going to be something that uh, our patients will benefit from. Now we don't, we collect the blood, we don't always process the blood, and sometimes we collect and process the blood, but the fact that we do that, uh, we still may not use it, especially if the bleeding is contained and there's no need for that. So the classic indications uh, are relative and not absolute, and that's for cell salvage. Uh, there's little data available uh, to substantiate the contraindications. This was an agreement between the manufacturers of cell salvage equipment and the FDA. There's significant data, which again is increasing, which supports the use of salvage, uh, cell salvage in these circumstances I just spoke about. And here's a cadre of cell saver machines in our institution just to show you 
that the resources here are available and are becoming available everywhere. Now, the issue of appropriate transfusion is mentioned early on in the early definition of patient blood management or blood management has been plaguing the transfusion medicine practice for years and publications out there show that anywhere from 35 to 50 percent of retinal transfusions are inappropriate and now there's even data suggesting up to 60 percent and for plasma up to 85 percent we do have a problem and the problem is not getting more donors the problem is in the overuse of blood and the World Health Organization as you know the World Health Assembly the WHO oversees the WHO had a resolution 6312 in 2000 and seven and adopted in 2010. And this resolution talked about the availability, safety, and quality of blood products. And they mention again that bearing in mind that patient blood management means that before surgery, they use the surgical population as their driver, if you will. Every reasonable measure, every reasonable measure should be taken to optimize the patient's own blood volume, meaning treating anemia, to minimize the patient's blood loss, all the harnessing of blood, both for the medical as well as the surgical population, and optimize the patient's specific physiologic tolerance to anemia. Not one size fits all, but again, looking at the patient and then appropriately treating them. And again, they include the three pillars which you're now familiar with in their recommendations. So as we wind down, what are the five drivers for the paradigm shift from the product, as you could see on the bottom of the slide, all the way to the concept of patient blood management? And we will describe to you just the tip of the iceberg, if you will, of each one of those, and we'll start with supply issue. And we talked about the fact that the aging population is now one of the users, if you will, uh, and mostly is by us, meaning the clinicians. And it says, uh, this is a publication again uh, from 2010 in Transfusion, that 70 to 80 year olds have the eightfold higher RBC consumption than 20 to 40 year old uh, patients because there is this notion that if you're old, you deserve to be transfused more. And I hear my colleagues say that all the time. There's not a single shred of evidence. If anything, the evidence shows the opposite, that the risk of transfusion in the elderly is just as high as the risk of transfusion in the younger. Now, this here is data from, uh, from Scandinavia, and what it's showing you is the consumption, if you will, of red cells as the age of the patient goes, uh, increases in time. And you could see that when you start getting into the 65 and older, where the blood use is there. And part of it is the notion that the elderly need more transfused blood than the younger, meaning that the younger can tolerate anemia. But the elderly will respond to treatment of anemia just like the young would, whether it be iron, ESAs, or folate. And again, trying to reduce the bloodshed in these patients will also reduce the amount of blood use that we see. Now, uh, the problem also that on a national basis, there is a very narrow margin between the donor and the amount of blood that's being transfused. In white here, you see the bars. These are European countries. I think this one uh, looks at the Netherlands as the midpoint, if you will, uh, with the arrow. But the white is donation per 1,000 population. And the red is RBC transfusion per 1,000 population, a way of comparing the different countries, if you will. And you could see that Denmark, on the left side, has about uh, 65 uh, units of red cell per 1,000 population, the highest transfusion rate in the world. But we're not that far behind. We're not on this particular slide. We're around 50 uh, units per 1,000. And we've got a ways to go because you could see that some countries can be as low as 20, if not below, uh, units per 1,000 and their population survives. The Australians, again, are making a concerted effort to reduce theirs, although they're already starting off with a much lower number than we have in the United States. From the American Red Cross, we know that as the age of the population increases, 
and you could see that demarcated in the, uh, the blue uh, line on the bottom is going to increase over time. Uh, we also could see that the uh, units transfused will be projected, but at the same time, on the donor side, we could see a reduction. So the units collected, you could see, are going down, if you will, especially from the healthy donor population. But the use of blood is projected to go higher if we do nothing about these relationships. So that talks about the supply issue. What about cost? Well, we know that Medicare is starting to look at the 10 most costly frequent medical errors on their books. And interestingly, hemorrhage uh, complicating a procedure, whether it be a surgical procedure or an invasive procedure, is on the books at about $960 million, almost a billion dollar a year. So Medicare will probably consider bleeding during surgery as no longer doing business as usual, and we'll look at it because in addition to the cost of the complication, the, uh, the response, if you will, with transfusion and infusion, as you could see, adds another significant economic layer uh, to this burden. So I assure you, as we're looking for more and more money in terms of health care cost increase, uh, this will be on the map. Now this is a study that was just published last year looking at the cost of transfusion as it relates to the cost of procuring or buying blood. And in fact, you see there are four institutions, two in Europe, two in the United States, two are academic, two are community hospitals, two are computerized blood banks, two are not. So you get the gamut of everything. And the red small uh, bars uh, represent the cost of purchasing or procurement, if you will, of red cells, which range in the United States anywhere from 250 as high as $350, depending of leukodepletion or not. The fact of the matter that uh, blood purchasing is about the same throughout. In some of the European countries, it's a little lower, and that's converted from euros. The blue bars represent the cost of transfusion of a patient with that unit of blood. And you could see that's a multiple of the purchase price. And hospitals are starting to recognize that, that these are multiples anywhere from three and a half to four and a half times the purchase price of a unit of blood. And of course, lastly, is again the, um, the cost, if you will, uh, or the mean transfusion cost per surgical patients, which again is extremely high. Now, it's a little lower in the medical patients because many times orders for blood for medical patients always uh, result in a transfusion, where in the surgical patients they may not. So we know that the cost of transfusion is significant, and hospitals such as the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic are now looking at this in terms of trying to reduce again, inappropriate utilization because that's money down the drain. There's an inherent risk in transfusion, and I will tell you that the process from vein to vein, donor to the recipient is complex, and errors can occur, human errors and non-human errors can occur any way along this process, causing a risk to the recipient. Now, we've changed in terms of looking at the risk because in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we were looking at hepatitis C and HIV, but today we're looking at the non-infectious complications as being major risk for patients, including transfusion-related acute lung injury, again, both hemolytic transfusion reactions and others that you can see here on the map. They're not common, but again, to the recipient, they could be devastating and deadly. And again, uh, the NIH reminds us that we're in no better shape today than we were in the 70s to handle a new epidemic, if it will, and you have no idea what is residing today in your blood bank because it could be that the epidemic is starting today. Now, this is not to frighten anybody. This is the reality of the situation so that in the absence of any potential benefit, transfusion will be only risk to that recipient. Now, what about the outcomes associated with transfusion? And this is that benefit side, if you will. This was published in the ISBT journal. This is the International Society for Blood Transfusion looking at patient blood management. But in there, there's a list of all of the infectious and non-infectious risks 
and you could see that the list is pretty long when it comes to transfusions. Now when we're looking at patients' outcome in terms of transfusion, this is a slew of articles published and you could see that the number of patients in each is considerable. Many of these are retrospective, of course, but these are surgical populations, non-cardiac surgical populations, where every one of these reports a negative outcome which includes mortality. So think twice again because unless you can demonstrate benefit and not just demonstrating the benefit of rising of hemoglobin, all you're doing is looking at risk. And this, by the way, is a cytoscan. This is a descriptive picture, if you will, of a live individual who has a hemoglobin which is around 3.5 grams. This hemoglobin this patient has been completely resuscitated with high viscosity fluid, what we do in this, in this uh, institution, and is able to mentate. His blood pressure is normal, heart rate is normal, he's making urine, he's warm, and as I mentioned, mentating. This individual cannot run a marathon, but certainly can, if treated appropriately, will increase their red cells. And the description here is to show you that every capillary, what you're looking at is actually single and multi cell capillaries, is being perfused, despite the fact that there's not enough red cells for quote-unquote oxygen delivery. And perfusion is what's important, not the level of, level of hemoglobin, and we've learned that over the years. Now, even in this hospital at 3.5, a patient will be transfused, and see what happens to the capillaries after the introduction of a single unit, if you will, of red cells. You see the architecture has completely changed. There are areas where there's absolutely no movement anymore of red cells or blood through the capillaries, suggesting a reduction in what's called functional capillary density, which is associated with, again, reduced survival. So this is qualitative, it's not quantitative. We don't know the impact on the individual patient, but you could see that the architecture has changed completely in the microcirculation of patients who undergo a transfusion of red cells from a blood bank. Now, when we looked at the outcome of patients being transfused, this was a publication, again, earlier in 2011, uh, looking at the International Consensus Conference on Transfusion Outcome. And here again, we looked at outcome as being beneficial for the patient. And uh, the definition was appropriateness, was defined as improved care, improved health of the patient, inappropriate described as reduction in the health of the patient. And uncertain, I don't have to explain. But you could see that only 12% of 400 clinical scenario not including hemorrhaging patients. So these are hospitalized patients with possibly low hemoglobin who are now asked whether transfusion, where the transfusion occurs normally in these situations, actually improve the care and the health of the patient. And you could see that 60% there was a decrement in the outcome of the patients. And in another 29%, it was uncertain and 12% uh, were the only ones that actually benefit. So the benefit-risk ratio clearly is not in favor of transfusion, and if that's the message that we can give you today, I think we've done our job. So next is, of course, efficacy of the unit that you're getting from the blood bank. And you could see that over time, red cells, which you're familiar with on the left, that's the normal morphology, decrease that uh, and change over time. Now, not only the morphology changes, but also the biology and the chemistry changes. And you could see that at 35 days, some of these may not be reversible. And hence, what happens is, when you infuse these red cells into patients, they may be so rigid that may block the flow of red cells, as you just seen, in the microcirculation of the recipient. I mentioned also that some of these may be reversible, some of them may not. But in fact, the, the amount of 2,3-DPG in red cells that are 10 to 14 days is almost nil, so that they may not be able to unload any of their oxygen in the periphery and may actually take oxygen from the patient's tissue, which is the reverse of what you'd like to do. And Gorin uh, shook up the cardiac community, if you will, in early 2000, 2002, by publishing this, showing again 
that one, two, three, or four, and five year survival, so early and late survival, was impacted as an independent factor by transfusion. And you could see that the splaying occurs early on in terms of survival. And we also know that this is as late as 2009 from Canada, showing in hospital mortality, acute renal failure, and deep sternal wound infection, and sepsis in patients who are either transfused intra operatively within 48 hours after the operation or after 48 hours in the operation. And you could see that the relative risks or the risk ratios is significant, 10 times that of non-transfused patients. Now you'll say, well, these patients were sicker, that's why they were transfused. In fact, they're matched, number one. And two, we know that, um, although that's the criticism of observational studies, uh, that is not probably the case. The signal is too strong if you see all of these uh, publications over and over again. The fact of the matter is that if the argument is that the patients that were sicker uh, received blood and hence they, uh, because they were sicker, they had more complications and high mortality, you would think that if blood was beneficial, that would reverse this trend, and it doesn't. So I think that the argument is weak on both ends, observational as well as the sicker patient, because we know that transfusion is so variable that many patients receive it despite not needing it. This was published again late last year, 2010. This is being done, this recording is being done in 2011. And again, looking at coronary artery bypass grafting in more than 750 institutions in the United States. And you could see the variability of red cell transfusion persists year after year despite all of the education that we try to get out. Close to almost 100% of patients versus 0%, there is a huge variability in red cell transfusion, in plasma transfusion, and in platelet transfusion, despite the underlying uh, patient's condition. Here's a, a study, a prospective study that was done in Austria on total knee replacement in patients looking at 16 hospitals. And you could see that for the underlying matching and stratifying for the underlying condition of patients, transfusion rates, again, are extremely variable even in Austria, no different than the United States. And you could see where hospital number one and two are as compared to number hospital 15 and 16. So the opportunity here is significant. If you draw a line at 20%, you could see how much blood could be saved without having any negative impact on the patient. And it goes back to the principles that we showed you initially. 97.4% of all transfusions could have been predicted by the level of anemia prior to surgery. These are all elective cases. Two, the volume of preoperative blood loss phlebotomy and blood loss intraoperatively. And three is the transfusion trigger rather than looking at the anemic patient and seeing what kind of therapy we can offer other than transfusion. And although this has not been published, we have had a glimpse into the activities of these hospitals after a year after the study was complete. And you could see in the purple bars that there is a considerable reduction except for one hospital in their performance of transfusion, if you will, without having any negative impact on their patients. Now, we know that if you use all of these modalities in concert, you can reduce the use of blood by one or two or multiple units of blood. And again, remember, we're talking about, if you recall, that distribution we had on the slide, the Gaussian distribution, where we talked about one to three units of blood, not the hemorrhaging patients. You could see how much blood can be saved with any of these modalities, which are easy but require a little bit of attention. And here's a publication from our institution in 2010 where we compared actually our a blood conservation techniques to non-use of conservation techniques in cardiac surgery. And again, what we did is we looked at all of these modalities and fit them into the pillars that you're already now familiar with. And look at our results. Our transfusion rate for coronary bypass patients is around 10% or 11% in comparison to the low average of the non-patient blood management hospitals in the state of New Jersey. This is data available through the Department of Health. 
you could see that mortality in our institutions is about a third of the mortality, except the mortality in the state of New Jersey, and serious complications, again, are lower in our institution compared to the hospitals that do coronary bypass grafting in the state of New Jersey without this type of program. Now, there are other hospitals that have been active in doing the same thing we're doing. This is a Rhode Island hospital, and you could see that they work through education, which is what hopefully we're doing today. Early enforcement, meaning involvement of clinicians to help this, and late enforcement and a reduction of 85% of the use of plasma in this hospital without having any negative impact on patient outcome. This is another institution that implemented similar program in Maine, and again, you could see the reduction of red cells without having any negative impact on patients' health. And you could see again that the number of patients being transfused is going down in this institution as well as a shift, if you will, of the trigger, so-called, of hemoglobin for transfusion. And again, the volume of transfusion of all components, because red cells are the driver, if you will, has been reduced in this institution with a tremendous amount of saving, $5.4 million during the years of the implementation of this activity. Now, I'm going to skip the longest, uh, length of stay and mortality rate because I already mentioned that there was no significant change in either, suggesting that this is just a reduction of uh, waste. The Department of Health and Human Services of the federal government has also placed recommendations on patient blood management. They're listed on this slide, but essentially to implement so that other hospitals as well as nationwide, you have the opportunity here to be on the cutting edge to address this. So let me summarize and tell you that significant variations occur in blood use. We know there's a lot of waste in the system. Overutilization is not only common, but now is being addressed by different agencies, including CMS. Changes in transfusion practice can occur quickly and can be hardwired to be durable. So you may have privileges in neighboring hospitals which don't have what we have here as activities when it comes to transfusion. But keep in mind, what we have here is coming and going everywhere. Experience and data suggest that a 30 to 50 percent reduction of blood use is realistic goal with an associated savings in blood acquisition and cost. So again, we can reduce this even further than what we have on the slide. But if we just do the 30 to 50 percent reduction, it's going to have significant impact on resources which now can be used for other things that we'd like to do with patients. So again, I thank you for um, for listening to this, and hopefully we could be a resource to you uh, throughout your tenure here at Englewood Hospital Medical Center.